where next for New Horizons? So the New Horizons probe was launched in 2006 and took 18 years to traverse the solar system, fly by Pluto marked in blue there, and then reach the previously unknown object now called Arakoth in 2019. And it's carried on, hurtling away out into the outer part of the solar system. It's uh, the fastest spacecraft we've ever sent in that direction. Having completed its flyby of Pluto, it had fuel left, and that enabled it to make a small course correction to take in Arakoth. And it still has some fuel remaining, so it may be possible to find a new target for it. It's now 60 astronomical units from the sun, that's twice the distance of Neptune, and heading away rapidly. And this year, it's in a fairly quiet mode. It's just listening and waiting, measuring the solar wind, the magnetic field, the radiation out there in the very far reaches of the solar system. The spacecraft itself carries numerous instruments. It has LORI, which is the long range imager, but it also has the SDC, the student dust collector created by students designed and built by them from the University of Colorado, Boulder. And this has been collecting dust grains, microscopic fragments all the way along the journey. And it's produced an interesting result during this post encounter flyby uh, pair that we've already had and this has shown us that it's unexpectedly dusty out in the region between 45 and 55 astronomical units so quite a large uh, 10 astronomical unit wide belt seems to contain more dust than the models had uh, previously envisaged and you can see the data for the rise in the dust towards the right hand end there, quite large error bars, but nevertheless, you can see that the point is going up, whereas the models shown in red and black were that it should drop away. Now, one explanation is that this is dust pushed outwards by solar radiation pressure, the momentum carried by the solar wind and by the sunlight hitting the particles, giving them a push out further away from the sun. But another possibility is that there is actually more ice crystals out there in deep space in general than we had thought. And that perhaps when they get closer in towards the inner part of the solar system, the heat from the sun is destroying them. And we've underestimated it all the way along. A um, couple of intriguing possibilities. Now, out at a distance of 47.8 astronomical units, this is the position where Kepler's laws of planetary motion tell us that an orbit will take just double the time that Neptune takes to go around the sun. That's 165.5 years. So if you double that up, you get, what, 321 years, a one to two resonance. And that's an interesting position because it's an unstable resonance. It will tend to give you the same gravitational tug every time you pass Neptune. Neptune will be in the same position and so it will gradually alter your orbit. But up until very recently it's been believed that this was the outer edge of the Kuiper belt. The number of objects would suddenly drop off a cliff hence the name the Kuiper Cliff. And so the belt of these uh, KBOs, these Kuiper Belt objects, starting round about that uh, 35, 36 astronomical units, builds up at uh, 38 to a reasonable peak and then falls away again. So by the time you get to 50 AU, there's very little. Now, there are one or two peaks shown on the, the diagram here. And that's interesting because we've been finding new ones. The Subaru telescope, uh, sponsored by the Japanese, but actually placed in Hawaii, has found 239 new trans bodies, bodies that orbit beyond Neptune in the solar system. 
And many of these are actually orbiting well beyond the so-called Kuiper cliff uh, in the region around 60, 70 astronomical units, maybe even extending as far out as 80. Now this points to the fact that perhaps the Kuiper belt isn't as constrained as we thought and stretches further away from the sun. But it also might indicate that there's essentially a second belt beyond the one we already know. And this diagram of the number of Kuiper belt objects based on distance kind of shows that there is that peak between about uh, 30 and 60 AU, and then another peak, perhaps smaller one, out around the 80 AU mark. So maybe we're beginning to learn that there is, in fact, a double belt structure to this outer part of the solar system. And this could account for that result from the SDC, the student dust collector. Perhaps collisions between this unexpectedly large number of objects out there is the source of all of that dust. Maybe objects smash into each other and the dust is just fragments that are scattered into that uh, extremely extended region. Well, it's really going to be very, very interesting now that we have the Vera Rubin telescope online. This telescope is a three mirror design with an eight meter primary mirror, giving it a very wide field of view, just over three degrees across the field. That's much, much wider than other designs can manage. And it's down to the fact that it has those three mirrors that allows it to get sharp images all the way to the edge of that three degree field. And what it's designed for is a large scale survey. It's going to create a movie, they say the largest movie uh, uh, ever in astronomy. It's going to take a series of 30 second long images all over the sky, each covering a three by three degree field, so just under 10 square degrees. And it's going to repeat this many, many times, going back over the same area time and time again. And that will allow a, a movie to be made of all of these individual areas of the sky. The initial run is supposed to be 10 years, but I think it'll probably run a lot longer than that. And the first runs are already producing data. This is just uh, from night seven, and uh, there have been over 2,000 asteroids in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars that were located, all those little uh, pale blue dots mark the positions of moving objects that were detected between a number of frames that were taken, a number of images revealed all these positions to have changed by enough to suggest that they're orbiting around about that 2.8 astronomical unit distance from the sun in the Mars-Jupiter gap. And it's likely that we're going to find an awful lot more of these. We're probably going to be running into the millions before long in the asteroid belt. But looking further out, it should also be able to pick up Kuiper belt objects. Now these move so much more slowly. Um, it takes a, a long time for them to uh, be seen to have moved from one frame to another. So you're going to need to have more than just a few images to do this. And certainly if you want to be able to determine their orbit, it's necessary to study them for a longer period of time. But I think Vera Rubin will produce a huge number of discoveries in the Kuiper belt as well. And it's very, very likely that some of these will lie ahead of the trajectory of the New Horizons probe. And with luck, the remaining fuel will allow us to take a uh, course correction and arrange a close flyby of at least one. Maybe we'll get lucky and it'll be more than one, who knows. But even if we can't get terribly close, we'll still be able to turn the camera back on, the lorry, the long range camera, and take images of these objects and the advantage of doing that, even if it's not a close flyby, is that it gives you a different aspect angle, looking at them from the side rather than from the front. 
and that can tell us things about how the light is scattering off them. It's not quite as exciting as seeing them up close and personal with a close flyby like we did with Pluto and Sharon and Arakoff. Uh, but it also allows us to plan future space missions. Now, that's all well and good, but it's probably going to take 25 years to fly a spacecraft all the way out to any of these very distant objects, even longer if we want to slow down um, and do anything more than just a very rapid one-off flyby. So thanks very much for listening to that short video about the prospects for new targets for New Horizons and how the Vera Rubin telescope is going to help us find some.